Good morning, juniors of Central Virginia Governor's School. My name's Tim Burnett. I am a PhD student at the University of Kansas in Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. There, I study climate change and plant responses. Specifically, I'm interested in how plants are responding to elevated carbon dioxide and increasing mean temperature. Both of these represent forms of abiotic stress. Abiotic stress is the negative impact of non-living factors. With, when we're talking about plants, these non-living factors include, include things such as water, so droughts, or temperature, or extreme heat waves. I rooted into this field at Governor's School. I graduated from Governor's School and Liberty High School in 2015. And my junior project at Governor's School was on light availability and root growth in Arabidopsis thaliana. A lot of the skills I developed there were huge for me when I went off to Grinnell College for my undergraduate degree and the University of Colorado Boulder where I did a summer research experience during undergrad. So I'm here today to talk to you about some of my work, some trends within the field of abiotic stress, climate change, and plants because I'm interested in giving back to you all. My experience at Governor's School was amazing. It's one of my favorite things I've ever done. And I want it to be the same for you. I want you to get as much out of it as possible, and I'm here to help with that. I'll be taking three to four students under my wing, serving as an additional resource for these plant bio projects. And so I want you all to be exposed to a bunch of different ideas for projects that you could consider. By no means should you limit yourself to what I present today. If you have an idea, you're welcome to reach out to me. I'll give you contact information at the end and talk to your research professor about working with me. So, without further ado, let's introduce you to abiotic stress, climate change, and plants. We're actually going to start, though, with understanding why we should care and who should care and what we should be caring about. Well, I'll argue that we should all care. A lot of these things are happening across the globe. We're seeing huge changes for plants across the globe. We're also seeing huge changes for ourselves. And so, we should all be caring because not only are these things influenced by us, some are caused by us, and so what we need to be thinking about is what our impact is. But we need to do research to understand what that impact is. But when we're thinking about what the impact is, there's a lot of different variables that we should be considering. So I'd like to draw our attention today to carbon dioxide, temperature, plastic pollution, and water. With the first three, we're going to specifically just talk about general trends and things you could consider for projects. With the last one, we'll talk about all of that and a little bit more. I'll draw your attention to three data sets that I've collected myself with drought projects so that you can have some idea about what's actually being done in the field. So let's talk carbon. So since the Industrial Revolution, we've seen an increase in carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. This graph here shows us the increases since 1965 up through about 2020, so that's a little bit of a projection. And we see that it's huge. There's huge increases in atmospheric carbon dioxide measured in parts per million. Within that, we do see some cycling within a year. The annual cycling of carbon dioxide is because plants drop their leaves, because they senesce, and because some even die out every year, the annuals. So when we're thinking about this, plants sequester or store a lot of carbon in their tissues. And so when plants die out, that's re-released back out. But despite this, we're seeing huge increases across the globe in what's actually being put in the atmosphere. And that has a lot of implications for how plants are responding, both as processes, but also just as organ sizes. So I'll draw your attention to gas exchange first. Gas exchange is the idea um, plants have little holes on their leaves. These are called stomata. And so at these stomata, Plants release water, but they take up carbon dioxide. How this process is changing under elevated carbon dioxide is interesting. We're also intrigued by how biomass, so this is just the bulk of the plant, what's it weigh, what's it look like, how big is it, is changing. We A lot of times trends are that under elevated CO2 plants are bigger, they weigh a little more. Lastly, I want to draw your attention to our foundational process for energy creation in plants, photosynthesis. Carbon dioxide is a key substrate for it, and so if there are increased levels, that may suggest that increased photosynthesis is happening. Not always, um, but it is interesting for us to consider. 
I also want to draw your attention to temperature. When we're thinking about temperature, we can think here we'll show, we'll talk data from 1880 to 2000, and we'll talk temperature anomalies. So the temperature anomaly is basically just saying that within that year, how different was it from within our um, mean temperatures that we've demonstrated across time. And so if we look at specifically from the 1980s to 2000s, we'll see on this far right side of the graph that all the anomaly is positive that it's about 0.2 to 0.6 increases in degrees Celsius. And that has huge impacts on various plant processes. Specifically, we can think about evaporation or transpiration, so water loss from the leaves. That's one of those basic gas exchange measures. And photosynthesis. Photosynthesis, a lot of the machinery down in the chloroplast where energy is produced in plants, is temperature dependent. And so if it gets too hot or too cold, plants may respond pretty negatively to temperature stress. Now these are mean temperature increases, so we know that's going on across the globe, but what we also see is that there are more heat waves, more extreme events. And so we know that this is important for a plant both during the heat wave and after. We don't know how well plants can recover their physiological functioning after a heat wave, and we don't know how plants respond to it very well during a heat wave. And so there's a lot of gaps here. So you could do a project on just growing plants at different temperatures all the time, or exposing plants to, say, for even three hours on a Friday, an extreme heat event, and understanding what's going on for that plant after it, and if they actually recover, if they even survive, if it's too extreme. When we're thinking about plastic, this is a relatively new idea that plastic is influencing seeds and plants on land. So here we show data um, of different sizes, so the 50, 500, and 4,800 nanometer sizes of plastic, but also along our x-axis, um, exposure concentration ranges quite a bit. Um, so this is, even though we have different sizes, we'll also put in a different number of the beads. And so both of these seem to affect how plants, how seeds germinate within Lepidium sativum. And so what we see is what I'd call a dose-dependent relationship. Um, there's a general trend of exposure as we increase our exposure. So as we're moving along our x-axis, we see reduced seed germination. There's a slight interaction here with size. The lowest line is always the 4,800 nanometers. And we see that that line is even much more lower at the 10 to the, uh, 10 to the 6 and 10 to the 7 exposure concentrations. The red line up top represents perfect germination, 100%, no plastic. And we see that there are huge gaps in germination, um, especially at 10 to the 4 on. It's interesting that at 10 to the 3, the exposure concentration, the 50 nanometer is almost the same as um, just seeds not exposed to plastic. So here, there's some projects to be done understanding how different species respond to plastic. You could think about how uh, light availability is mediated by plastic. Let's say plastic stuck on top of the soil and the seeds are underneath. Will they actually germinate? Will the water reach them that's needed? So there's a bunch of projects here for you to consider, and this is a huge gap in the field. So if you're interested in pollution and plant responses, or just pollution in general, plants may be a good way for you to move. So now I'd like to draw our attention to drought, and this is what we'll continue with for the rest of the presentation. So when we're thinking about drought, uh, here we have from 1890 to 2020, uh, the Palmer Drought Severity Index. You'll see that it's pretty variable. Uh, but what we do see is that those below negative two are really, really extreme droughts. They won't, they happen pretty rarely, but they have huge impacts for plants within that year and after that year. And when that's happening, there's a lot of different things that we could consider. We know that this is actually supposed to increase in the future. Specific areas across the globe will see huge, huge droughts, especially southwest U.S., they're seeing a huge mega drought now. And so that has huge implications for what plants look like, both individuals, a plant species, so just one type of plant, so a maple tree, for example, but also how plant communities, so all the different plants coming together are changing. So when we're thinking about what's happening within the plant, we can talk a few different things. First off, let's talk processes. Evaporation, photosynthesis. It's pretty interesting because evaporation um, is water being lost from the plant. If it's really dry, there's no water to lose. And so how evaporation is changing is important. When we're thinking about photosynthesis, water is a key 
player in photosynthesis. And so what we need to be thinking about there is if water is limited, how is photosynthesis going to change? We can also talk about organs. So when we're thinking about seeds, seeds may not germinate if there's not enough water. Or if there's too much water, they may get waterlogged and rot. We can think about biomass. Under reduced water, plants are often smaller. And when we're thinking about roots, that's one of the root's key goals is to take up water for the plant. And so if there's less water there, it's going to be important for plants to root deeper to access more water or to change their branching behavior to get more water. These are just things you could consider. Of course, you can always bring up others. So now we're going to talk some data that I actually have on plants responding to drought in prairies. So what I found is that when we are taking water away, so the drought treatment on the x-axis, when we're letting whatever's falling from the sky hit the control, and when we're taking the water that should have hit the drought and adding it to the addition site, we're understanding here how leaves are changing. So within prairie species, we actually demonstrated at Boulder that droughted leaves are smaller and that leaves that are in the control sites just getting normal precipitation and getting more water um, are changing much less. Um, they're actually staying about the same. So it doesn't seem to us that leaves are really changing that much if you're getting more water or if you're getting just normal precipitation for Boulder, Colorado. But when we're making it a dry year for Boulder in that drought site, leaves are much narrower and their percent width change is pretty significant. We can also, within those same sites where we're doing the drought control addition, think about height. This was fairly interesting to us. Uh, the only significant difference between the two was control versus addition. So the sites getting just the normal precipitation were often taller um, than the rest. But in the addition and drought sites, they were shorter. And so why plants that are getting very little water and a lot of water are shorter than others is unclear. It could be something to do with competing for light or putting more water into, I mean, putting more resources into the soil to either pick up more water or get other nutrients that we need. Lastly, I'll draw our attention to succulents. Succulents is that idea of storing water. And so what we see is that in different plant organs, water is stored differently. And it's also stored differently by species. So here, um, we were trying to understand if leaves and stems stored the same amount of water within prairie species. And they don't. They're not even related, and they're in very, they're more often than not, not equal. Um, and so what this suggests is that in stems and leaves, they're not the same. In stems and leaves, they're storing different amount of water, and that has implications for how different plant organs are going to respond to drought. So, thank you for listening. Um, if you're curious about my research further, please do reach out. There's my email and my website. Uh, I'd like to thank my advisors to date, Vincent Card at Brunel, Katie Suiting at Boulder, and Joy Ward at the University of Kansas. Uh, if you're interested in working with me uh, for junior research, talk to your research instructor and your mentor, and we'll work something out. Um, I'm happy to help in whatever capacity you want. I will max out the students at three to four, just depending on what's needed. Uh, so thanks for listening. Bye.